Okay, so uh, so welcome to MSE 498 AF, uh, Computational Materials Science and Engineering. Um, and so today I thought I'd just start off with an introduction as to what do we actually mean by Computational Materials Science and Engineering and uh, what we're going to cover in this, in this course. Okay, so what is CMSE? So CMSE stands for Computational Materials Science and Engineering, which uh, can be thought of perhaps as the application of computational tools to materials discovery, characterization, design, testing, and optimization. Uh, perhaps a simpler way of thinking about it is basically doing material science with the aid of computation. So perhaps considering computers as a way to do in silico experiments. Um, so you program the physical laws of your system, whether that's quantum mechanics or classical mechanics um, or continuum mechanics, into your computer. Um, and then you test the properties and behavior of your system. Um, another acronym you'll hear frequently is Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, or ICME. And the important word there is integrated. And so it's the integration of computational uh, material science and engineering at different levels. Um, so, for example, the integration of quantum theory with molecular simulations at a classical level, with finite element um, analysis at a higher level, or continuum mechanics at the highest level. And it's the integration between these, so the passing of information between the different levels, between the different um, physics, um, that you, you may treat the system at, in a quantum manner and compute a particular quantity, uh, such as the elasticity, and use that to parameterize a simulation um, using classical mechanics at a higher level. Um, and so you can also think of it, think as the, uh, the integration is standing for the integration between computation and experiments. That's the other part of this integrated um, in the ICME um, acronym. And so using computation and experiment in tandem to accelerate uh, materials discovery, development, um, and testing. Um, okay, and so, so what is sort of the the reason that we're doing these things. So, so why are we using computational tools? Well, basically, the, the theory of materials has been around for hundreds of years, um, some parts longer than others, of course. And so down at the very bottom, where we treat electrons on the nanoscale, um, this is really the, the, the realm of quantum mechanics. Um, and so we can understand the theory, we can write down equations, and we can use computers to help us solve these equations. Um, so perhaps a good example is looking at a slightly larger scale, on the molecular scale. And so we know that atoms and molecules are governed by Newton's equations of motion, um, and to a good approximation if we're smearing out the electronic effects. And so we can write down the equations by which the atoms and molecules respond and solve them in principle by hand. But of course, it's a very laborious process. It would take you thousands of years to simulate um, a few picoseconds of, uh, of molecular simulation if you're solving things by hand. So we appeal to computation. So we program the theory, the physical laws, into a computer. And then we run the simulation and see how the system responds. And so the way is provided by high-performance computation. And so the computers sitting in front of you are actually pretty powerful machines. Um, they're much more powerful than, than the computer, uh, the computational hardware that, that sent the first astronauts to the moon. Um, and so computation is coming coming along in leaps and bounds, and we're still following Moore's law. We'll see that a little bit later on, uh, which allows us to perform computation very cheaply. And then the will to do all this is really from the um, unification of um, academia, public policy, and industry. And so we'll discuss a little bit about that. But they're the stakeholders in those three areas um, are really in agreement that computational material science and engineering needs to play a larger role in education, in industry, um, and in, in sort of the, the public um, life of the United States in order to, to allow us to remain competitive and uh, drive us forward into the, the, new, um, the new century. And so does it work? Okay, we can do computation. Um, I've tried to explain to you why one might want to do computation, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But, but really, does this work? And so materials are governed by mostly known physical laws, and so we can probe their behavior in three ways. So classically, we've done this using experimentation and theory, and the so-called third pillar of science, uh, somewhat of a cliche now, computation. And so it presents a third way to do science by basically performing in silico experiments. And so we program into the computer the physical laws governing a little chunk of space um, containing the material that we're interested in. And then that allows us to simulate how that little chunk of space might behave. And so it really is an experiment in silico. And we can ask such questions as what are the properties of that material? How does it behave under um, certain um, external forces or fields? 
we can do hypothesis testing um, and we, we can ask questions such as what if we were sub to subject it to a particular force? What if we were to replace one constituent of the alloy with another? To do sort of high throughput computational screening um, that may be very laborious to do experimentally. Um, one thing that computation really can do that experiment cannot is it allows you to test things that are unphysical in the real world. So um, why might one want to do this? Well, imagine you were studying water in a slit pore, um, such as might occur in a zeolite, for example. Um, a question you may ask is, is the stability of the water in the pore governed mainly by electrostatics or Leonard Jones' dispersion interactions? And so computation allows you to probe such questions by um, turning off one or other of those interactions. So for example, you could turn off the electrostatic interactions between the water and the zeolite, um, and you could see how the system behaves. And so it allows you to ask very deep fundamental questions that are either very difficult or actually impossible to do experimentally and do high throughput screening of, um, of, of large candidate sets of materials that may be very laborious, expensive, or time consuming. Um, so that's not to say that experiments are, are, should, should be thrown out the window. Uh, um, of course not. Um, so experiments really are the gold standard, um, but computation occupies a niche that allows us to do things that would be very difficult to do experimentally or very expensive to do experimentally. Um, okay, so materials science and engineering is inherently multi-scale, and so things that we worry about as material scientists and engineers range from the electronic all the way up to the macro scale. And so physics, chemistry, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, maybe the engineering discipline less so, um, all have long-standing computa computational traditions that are confined to a particular scale. So if you're a physicist, perhaps you're primarily interested in electronic structure. Um, if you are perhaps a chemical engineer, maybe you're interested up at the macro scale to design a reactor. Uh, but as material scientists, very frequently need, we need to worry about all of these scales. And so we need to worry about how the electronic effects are feeding into the atomistic level effects, which are manipulating the microstructure, which are controlling the macro scale behavior of our system. And so material science and engineering is inherently multi-scale and multi-physics which makes things very difficult because we have to treat different levels with different physics and then we have to couple those levels together. Um, so for this reason, perhaps, uh, material science and engineering is a relative latecomer to the mature um, field of sort of computational um, engineering. And so just to illustrate here once again, perhaps you're interested in designing a, a brand new um, aero body. You work for Boeing, for example. Um, and so we need to worry about grain boundaries, but grain boundaries, of course, you need to worry about defects, and then defects, you need to worry about atoms, and if you're looking at atoms, you may need to worry about electrons. And so really, if you're designing a brand new composite or brand new alloy, you need to worry about all of these levels to varying degrees. Um, so just another example, uh, perhaps you're worried about designing an engine block, you work for Ford Motor Company, and so, of course, you could think about all these scales, but really the point I'm trying to illustrate uh, with this slide is you need to determine which length scales are important for the problem at hand. And so you need to develop um, an understanding of what is the right question to ask, what is the right um, length scale and time scale that can give you the answer, and then what computational tool can you use to give you the answer at that length and time scale. So, for example, perhaps the thing you're really interested in is the microstructure of the material. So perhaps one might want to use molecular dynamics um, to, to really figure out what the um, atomistic structure of the material is, coupled with some finite element analysis that could let you resolve grain boundaries in their interaction. Um, conversely, perhaps you're interested in how the engine block as a whole responds to um, shear stresses. And so maybe you want to um, approach this question using finite element analysis or even some continuum type models, so PTEs or ODEs. So part of this course is going to be figuring out the right questions to ask and how you get the answers to those questions. Um, okay, so that's sort of the motivation. But then how do we actually do this in practice? So what, what do we do on the computer to answer the questions, such as the ones you've been describing? Um, so what I'm trying to illustrate with this slide is the various land scales one might be interested in and then the types of codes that one might run to, to understand um, the dynamics or the behavior of the material at its land scales. And so down at the very bottom there in the ab initio um, sort of electronic structure, one might be interested in interatomic forces, um, excited states, charge transfer, the structure of the electrons in your material. And so codes exist. Some examples include QBox or Latte um, to do electronic structure calculations. 
If you're interested in slightly larger scale, molecular dynamics might be the, the approach of choice. And so there's some codes listed there. Um, longer time, you can do accelerated molecular dynamics and moving up the hierarchy of length and time scales, phase field, dislocation dynamics, finite element analysis, all the way up to continuum mechanics. And so in this course, we're going to explore four different um, codes, which each tackle a different length and time scale. Um, okay, so that's the computational material science and engineering. So how about the integrated computational materials engineering? So I told you the important word there is integration. Um, okay, so let's look at this particular example. So illustrate by example of uh, the design of a reinforced titanium armor composite. So a brand new material, and you want to design this using computation to help guide um, how you might want to synthesize this material and how it will behave. So ignore the, the top part of the slide for a second. The really important part, the integrated part, comes at the bottom. So let's look at the bottom left. And so imagine you want to study the electronic structure to figure out what the um, structure of the atoms and the electrons are going to be at equilibrium in your material. And so you may run a DFT simulation. You may compute from that DFT simulation the interfacial energy and elasticity of your material, which you would then pass up to a molecular dynamics simulation and use those um, quantities to, to parameterize a molecular dynamics force field that reproduces that particular interfacial energy and elasticity. You could then run a molecular dynamics simulation at much longer time scales and much larger length scales to allow you to see how the uh, material behaves when you, when you can treat um, many hundreds or thousands of atoms. Then perhaps you want to pass up some uh, parameters to a finite element model. So perhaps you find the deformation or dislocation mechanisms um, that are present in your material using molecular dynamic simulation, and you could pass them up to some sort of um, finite element model where you can simulate how, those, uh, how the deformation occurs or how the dislocations propagate, again, at much larger length and time scales than would have been possible by doing molecular dynamics or indeed um, electronic structure. And so you can see that you can compute very fundamental quantities using high-level theories, such as DFT or molecular dynamics, and then pass those quantities up the hierarchy to lower levels of theory to allow you to study things on larger lengths and timescales. Um, okay, and so up the top there, what, what, what we're trying to show is another way of, of doing an integration of, uh, of different uh, simulation uh, methodologies at different levels of uh, physics. Um, into sort of an internal state variable model, an ISV model. So those handshakes are meant to be showing how um, you can compute different properties of your material using different simulation methodologies and couple those together in some unified um, continuum model. But the part that we're really uh, going to be interested in, in this course, the, the, in the ICME spirit, is really the passing up and down of quantities, mainly up the, uh, the length and time scale hierarchy, as illustrated at the bottom of this slide. So why would one want to do computational material science and engineering, or indeed integrated computational materials engineering? Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, uh, Moore's law still just continues to hold. So this was uh, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, uh, his prediction in 1965 that the number of transistors that you could fit on a chip um, should double approximately every two years, and indeed that, that trend does um, still hold. Um, in part, it continues to hold because it's actually one of the performance objectives for some of the chip manufacturers is to double the number of transistors every two years. Nevertheless, uh, what this means is that we can ride um, the, the curve of Moore's law um, in order to really exploit very cheap and powerful computation to do material science and engineering for us. And so... It means that computation is cheaper and more powerful, really, than, than ever before, and we can exploit that to do, to do some interesting science and engineering. Um, so, so what is driving this? Computation is certainly enabling it, but, but what is driving us to do this? Well, um, so this is one of the rare places where industry, um, government, public policy, and academia really are, are united in, in the um, opinion that computational material science and engineering is really a, a necessary to the drive innovation and discovery in the new century. And so it's critical to addressing national goals, um, so mineral security, biomedicine, um, that's the public policy side of things. Industrially, it's, it's really important for bringing new products to market more cheaply and quicker than ever before. And so renewable energy, how do we design next generation solar cells? How do we design new prosthetics for our military veterans? In order to do those things more efficiently, computation is going to play a large role. In academia, clearly computation is very important for research, for, for, for sort of the research endeavor that we carry out at universities, but also for training the next generation workforce um, 
in these computational tools such that they can start to, to work to address these national goals and work in industry um, w with the requisite tools and skill set to, to, to use that computation. Um, okay, so just a, a few slides on each of these three stakeholders of public policy, industry, and academia. Um, if you're interested, you can go and take a look at the uh, Materials Genome Initiative, which is a White House uh, publication that came out in June 2011. And so it's a pretty thin little booklet, but it, it's sort of interesting. And it outlines um, the Obama administration's vision for computational materials science and engineering as part of, uh, of uh, the materials endeavor, um, sort of materials discovery and development endeavor for the new century. Um, in tandem to that, there is a National Research Council publication on integrated computational materials engineering. So perhaps you can think of the materials genome initiative as computational materials science and engineering, CMSE and the, the publication from the NRC as the ICME counterpart to that. And so it, it really talks about how um, ICME is going to be vital for industrial and national uh, competitiveness again in the new century. Um, and so just a highlight from the Materials Genome Initiative, that, that perhaps this really encapsulates uh, why public policy is so focused on, on computational materials, um, science and engineering. So the time frame for incorporating advanced materials into applications is remarkably long. Um, and so to develop, manufacture, and deploy advanced materials two times faster at a fraction of the cost is, is sort of a, a vital um, national goal. So perhaps as an example, we could consider the airframe materials, the, the composites that are being used in the next generation jetliners today. Those materials were actually discovered back in the 70s. Um, but it's taken this long in order to um, put them through the development and testing pipeline such that they're, they're now being deployed today. And so if we're able to compress that pipeline um, and indeed make it cheaper, that would allow us to develop materials much quicker. And so perhaps that's uh, well illustrated in this slide, which is sort of pertains to industry. The global competitiveness de uh, depends on accelerating materials development and deployment. So trying to compress down this pipeline from discovery to deployment. Um, so for example, in the property optimization chunk of this pipeline, Perhaps we can use computational tools in order to accelerate this optimization of properties to do high throughput screening of different alloys, different mixtures, different biomolecules um, to give you materials with the properties that you desire. Um, and so perhaps one way to think about a niche that CMSE can occupy is to compress this pipeline by eliminating laborious, costly um, experimental trial and error and doing a lot of this work on the computer. So, of course, that doesn't mean you can eliminate experiment, uh, experimentation and, and uh, real-world trials entirely, but perhaps you can focus them and remove a lot of the expensive, laborious uh, parts of these studies um, onto the computer where things are much cheaper and perhaps much faster. So, validated computational platforms and models to perform uh, various jobs in, in industrial materials development and deployment. So, rapid prototyping, um, optimization, reliab reliability testing, material selection. These are all things that the computation can play an important role. Um, so just as a, a very brief case study, uh, an example, Ford Motor Company uh, a few years ago decided they wanted to design um, a new aluminum powertrain. So I guess previously this had maybe been a um, steel-based uh, powertrain. And so instead of following their standard materials development pipeline, they decided to, to make a test and incorporate computational material science and engineering into their design pipeline. And what they found at the end of the study was they were actually able to reduce the number of experimental iterations required to design this new powertrain, um, shortening the development time by around 20% and making cost savings of $20 million per year. Um, and so clearly computation is not just a tool uh, for, for academia. It, it really has real-world utility and real-world implications. And so you, you can see this is just one example. Um, Boeing, Intel, these sorts of folks are also using comp computation extensively. And then academia. Um, so again, a couple of short papers if you're interested in reading about um, what stake academia has in computational materials, science and engineering. So these two papers are really geared towards teaching and training um, and, and sort of they, they polled the faculty at various universities, um, the staff at national labs, and then a bunch of industrial representatives um, from, from sort of blue chip industrial materials companies and asked them, you know, what, what do you foresee as the needs for computation in the, in the next century? And so um, one of the, the sort of foundational findings that came out of this is that industry really wants academia to do a better job of training folks in computational tools such that they can um, plug them into 
um, employee roles that depend on computation. And so it's the role of the academy to develop CMSE tools and use them for research, but also to train folks in their use. So it's part of my job as an educator to, to um, train folks like you in the use of computational tools so that you can then take that to in industry um, upon graduation. Um, and so studies have, uh, have identified a role for formal undergraduate and graduate training um, in computational materials science and engineering to um, support your job prospects, um, improve employee productivity, and also provide you with, uh, with a running start if you decide to pursue further academic training and uh, research projects based on computation. And so other key findings from these, the, the pair of studies I showed you on the previous slide was that, and this is kind of interesting, is that there's an academic industrial mismatch in our software focus. So academics tend to focus heavily on DFT um, and molecular dynamics uh, type software, whereas in industry, folks would tend to prefer for their, their employees to be trained in things like finite element uh, modeling and continuum calculation of phase equilibria software. Um, and so it's part of the, the motivating factor for this course is that we, we try and tackle both. And so we show, um, we want to expose you to software that's both most relevant to academia and to industry. Um, also, another finding was uh, that industry tends to privilege software skills, so the ability to use packages to solve problems rather than programming. And so they would prefer that you come in with the ability to um, use calculation of phase, phase diagram software, use finite element software, rather than being able to, to sort of be a crackerjack Python or C++ programmer. And so again, that's uh, one of the, the motivating factors for this course, is that we're not going to really worry too much about programming. We just want to expose you and give you competence in a variety of software packages. Um, and so finally, one of the other findings was that, that academic training does a good job of giving you hands-on experience in experimental labs, but not in computation. And so we're really running this lab, and the way I think about this course is as a computational lab. And so there's going to be some lectures, but then the largest chunk of the course is basically you getting your hands dirty using software packages. And so um, developing, understanding, competency, familiarity with software that you can then take on to, to wherever you go next, whether that be academic research um, or, an, or an industrial job. Um, finally, perhaps we're being driven slightly by ABET requirements. So ABET is the accreditation body for the material science departments in the United States. And so one of the requirements for accreditation is that uh, the folks, the graduate assistant department, under, undergraduates uh, receiving their bachelor's, are able to use experimental, statistical, and computational methods. And so this course is trying to answer and the third part of that. Um, okay, so a little bit more about this course. And so a number of material science departments around the country are, um, are in the process of, or are very early stages of, incorporating computational material science and engineering into their undergraduate and graduate curricula. And so there are sort of two models. You could plug CMSE into existing courses or establish a new course. So mm -hmm. clearly we have chosen the latter, and that's, uh, that's uh, sort of the genesis of this course that you're currently sitting in, MSE 498 AF. And so it's meant to be a complement to an existing course in the, the curriculum here at Illinois, which is MSE 458, which is um, Atomic Scale Simulations. And so that offers sort of deep exposure to classical simulation and statistical mechanics, and there's a large programming component where you actually write Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics codes. So we are trying to answer a different part um, of, of sort of the goals of academia, which is to pro provide you broad um, hands-on experience to a variety of software packages at a variety of levels. Um, okay, and so where can you find out more uh, about computational material science and engineering or find some tools to do computational material science and engineering? So there are a number of resources. So uh, TMS has a, has a nice sort of um, forum, an online forum, where you can read about um, CMSE, um, download some, some interesting articles and perhaps use some tools. Um, NanoHub is a repository for CMSE software packages and actually one of the softwares that we're going to use, uh, Finite Element Model, we're going to use via, via NanoHub. Um, the Materials Computation Center has a, has a nice um, sort of infrastructure and MatDL. And so these are all great places to look if you're interested in finding out more about CMS. Um, so as to particular software packages, what, what, what's available? Um, so at the electronic level, there, there's just so many. And so I started to list them here and realized that the futile effort, they're sort of um, uh, six feet long, it would, it would take to, to list all these packages. So instead, I'm just going to refer you to the Wikipedia page. Uh, where there's a list of uh, quantum chemistry, um, so hard free fog, DFT type software packages. Again, similarly for molecular simulation, there's a vast number of packages available and finite element. 
Uh, phase equilibria, there's relatively fewer, so I can list them here. The one we're going to use is ThermalCalc. And so this is basically goes by the name of phase calculation software or um, CalFAD, calculation of phase diagram software. And then finally, and though we're not going to touch on this here, there's computer-aided design. And so all these different levels of software feed into sort of CAD, so computer computational design materials. So what are we going to study in particular in this course? Um, first of all, we're going to study the Bash shell. So we're going to get you up to speed on Linux and Bash. So I know not everybody here is terribly familiar with these things, but basically all like 90% of computational scientific computing packages are written for Linux. Um, a lot of them don't have nice graphical user interfaces, um, and so you have to interact with them through the command lines using the Bash shell. And so the first week, we're going to have a quick primer on Linux and Bash to get you up to speed um, so you're comfortable using um, Bash and you can interact with, with um, computational materials, science and engineering software. Um, we're also going to do a quick module on MATLAB. So I know some of you are familiar with MATLAB, some of you less so. But MATLAB is a very powerful package for doing analysis. And so, okay, you run your in silico experiment, you have the results of your molecular dynamics simulation or your, uh, your finite element modeling results. So how are you going to analyze and, and plot these? And so MATLAB is a great place to do that. Very powerful statistical analysis and it can generate very, um, very beautiful plots and, and publication quality plots. So um, let's use MATLAB, let's not use Excel. Um, and so part of the course is sort of getting more familiar with, with MATLAB and its capabilities. Okay, and so what are the four software packages we're going to use? So we're going to tackle computational material science and engineering at four land scales. So first of all, we're going to do some electronic structure calculations. So we're going to use a DFT software package known as Quantum Espresso. We're then going to um, use that package to sort of analyze uh, the hydrogen molecule um, and also aluminum, so the behavior of aluminum down at the electronic scale. We're then going to move up to uh, molecular dynamics and so classical mechanics. So um, we're going to look at atoms on the scale uh, where we can sort of forget about electronic effects, capture them implicitly, and simulate the motion of the atoms. And so here we're going to look at, again, aluminum, um, and we're going to see how aluminum behaves under different stresses and strains to compute its um, bulk modulus, its uh, Young's modulus, and then look at crack propagation in a chunk of aluminum. Um, we're then going to move up to uh, finite element analysis. So we're going to use a software package known as OOF2 to study how um, a chunk of aluminum behaves under, under a sort of stress field um, and look at how uh, perhaps a, a, a bimetallic strip reacts to, to differences in temperature. And then finally, we're going to move up to continuum models. So we're going to do calculation of phase diagrams using thermal calc. And so under particular conditions, uh, temperature, pressure, what do we predict the stable phase of our system is going to be? Um, and how can we change the stable phase by sort of messing with temperature, pressure, composition of our system? And so here we're going to study how um, the stable phases, so the equilibrium phases of an aluminum alloy and a, and a stainless steel, and actually use thermocal to help, help us design uh, a stainless steel for, uh, for a particular purpose. So how much chromium, how much carbon do we need to add to give this steel the particular properties that we want? And so through all of this, I'm trying to sort of um, embed the spirit of ICME, so Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, uh, by looking at aluminum at every land scale. And so we're going to look at aluminum at the electronic scale, um, at the sort of atomistic scale, um, up at finite element model, and then at the continuum scale. And we're going to pass properties we calculate at one scale up to, to another scale to, to, to allow us to sort of integrate different physics at different scales into sort of a unified pipeline. Um, so why might that be useful? Well, imagine you d discovered a brand new material that no one had ever studied before. It was incredibly expensive and difficult to study experimentally. So maybe one way you could start um, making continuum level predictions is to study it first at the very lowest land scales, the electronic structure and its um, atomistic structure, um, compute properties of the material at those scales, and then pass them up as parameters to larger scales. So you can actually start doing finite element modeling or continuum modeling of your, of your material. Um, okay, so just uh, to close out uh, the introduction, uh, just a couple of surveys. So first of all, uh, we'll check if everyone can attend the, the officers that I proposed uh, for, for this particular course, and I'll issue a couple of uh, surveys um, just to sort of gauge your current level of competence um, and familiarity with, with the softwares that we're going to be using in this course. Um, and then also issue you a, a survey on computation in the material science and engineering uh, curriculum that the department is sort of starting to collect some statistics and opinions on. 
Um, okay, so, so let me stop there and then, then um, and we, we can discuss uh, these things.